day was going to come, did it? <laughs> Thought that I was going to be in the... All right, boys and girls, while he's messing with that, you can be dismissed for Children's Church. All right, let me go back. <clears throat> I'm not sure if they're doing this yet, but let me just get a little plug for what's going to be happening. When is the Peacemakers thing? Is it after? Easter. After Easter, coming up, we have a curriculum that is uh, very targeted and, and uh, intentional with all of our Christian ed programs. After Easter, we're going to be going back and teaching the children biblical peacemaking principles. In the past, that has been interesting because the kids learn this really easily. And then when there's conflict at home, not that any of you ever have conflict, but when there's conflict at home, the kids will say things. We've gotten feedback like, Dad, do you think you need to look at the log in your own eye before you look at the splinter in mom's eye or something like that? And it's uh, like, whoa, where did they get that from? But uh, <clears throat> that's coming up. Let's open our Bibles to the last chapter in the book of Acts, chapter 28. And we will, Lord willing, we're going to actually be able to deal with all the verses of this chapter next Sunday as I mentioned Pastor Ron will be here we're looking forward to being able to honor him and encourage him I'm sure it's a blessing when he comes back here before Ron came to to Enoch and Cedar City to plant this church 40 years ago he actually was up his first church was up in Kaysville and that church is uh, doing very well. And they, uh, it's a little closer to where Ron lives. And he's back there a little bit more. But many of you, I don't think, have ever met Ron and Wanda. And I'm looking forward to you having the chance. They're very, very gracious people. And, uh, and he is now more than in the past. I think he's primarily involved in instruction at Frontier School of the Bible in LaGrange, Wyoming. And he's training pastors and Christian workers in that capacity. But he and Wanda are very special people. And I'm looking forward to next Sunday quite, quite a lot. <clears throat> we, uh, if you've been here through this study, I believe we started this close to two years ago. And uh, we have had some Sundays where we were not in the book. We had a few guest speakers in those two couple years. We've had holidays where we would talk about a Christmas or, East, or a resurrection message. But uh, we're now finishing this book. The act that, uh, and in, in this passage that we're reading today, and I want to read, read this to you before we get started. In the first verse is the phrase from which we're going to get the title for this message because the book kind of ends in a strange way. We don't really, a lot of historical things will conclude with the, the characters that they're following. You'll kind of, you see them come on the stage and then you see them go off the stage. And that doesn't really happen. The Spirit of God did not intend for us in the his, this transitional and historical book of Acts it, it, it's, it's like he wanted us to be left hanging or thinking like, yes, and it keeps going. The, the, the church continues. And I think that uh, it, it's interesting the way that it, it does end. But I want to, uh, if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Acts chapter 28. There's only 31 verses in this. I'd like to read this to you. And uh, as you will see in the very first verse, uh, there is this phrase that they were brought safely through. If you've been here for the last couple of weeks, we were seeing how uh, as Paul is being transported now to face 
He's appealed his case to the emperor. So to Rome he is headed. And he's under, he's as a prisoner, he's under the, uh, under the watchful custody of Julius, who's a centurion. And they have had a life-threatening situation in a storm for 14 days. They're, they probably, the chances of them, of anybody surviving that storm would have appeared to be absolutely ridiculous. But they all made it safely ashore. Whether they could swim or not, the Lord had promised Paul that that would happen, and they've made that. And we ended the, the 27th chapter with them fulfilling that promise that the Lord had said. They, as the ship was caught on the sandbar or the reef, and the waves began to crash on the back of it, and the ship is breaking up, the soldiers intended to kill the prisoners because, as you know, I hope you know, that the rule was that if you are a, a soldier and you have prisoners under your charge, that if they, whatever sentence they had coming, if, if they escape under your charge, you take their place and you get their sentence. And, it, and many times it meant that the, that soldier was killed. And so the soldiers with other prisoners besides Paul that were on that ship, they took out their weapons and were preparing to kill Paul and, and the others that were on that ship as, as, as prisoners headed to Rome. And they were stopped, and uh, they, they didn't need to kill him. They all, they all safely made it there and continued on their journey, as we'll see in this chapter. So let me begin reading it. Verse 1. When they had been brought safely through, then we, Luke is still with them and giving a firsthand account of what's going on, then we found out that the island was called Malta. The natives showed us extraordinary kindness, for because of the rain that had set in and because of the cold, they kindled a fire and received us all. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself on his hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began saying to one another, Undoubtedly this man is a murderer, and though he has been saved from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Let me turn this on before I forget. <clears throat> However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. But they were expecting that he was about to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. But after they had waited a long time and had seen nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and began to say that he was a god. Now in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the leading man of the island named uh, Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us courteously three days. And it happened that the father of Publius was lying in bed afflicted with recurrent fever and dysentery. And Paul went in to see him. And after he had prayed, he laid his hands on him and healed him. After this happened, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases were coming to him and getting cured. They also honored us with many marks of respect. When we were setting sail, they supplied us with all we needed. At the end of three months, we set sail on an Alexandrian ship, which had wintered at the island, and which had the twin brothers for its figurehead. After we put in at Syracuse, we stayed there for three days. From there, we sailed around and arrived at Regium, and a day later, a south wind sprang up. And on the second day, we came to Puteli. And... There we found some brethren and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And thus we came to Rome. And the brethren, when they heard about us, came from there as far as the market of Appius and three inns to meet us. And when Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. When we entered Rome, Paul was allowed to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. After three days, Paul called together those who were the leading men of the Jews 
And when they came together, he began saying to them, Brethren, though I had done nothing against our people or the customs of our fathers, yet I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. And when they had examined me, they were willing to release me because there was no grounds for putting me to death. But when the Jews objected, I was forced to appeal to Caesar, not that I had any accusation against my nation. For this reason, therefore, I requested to see you and to speak with you, for I'm wearing this chain for the sake of the hope of Israel. They said to him, We have neither received letters from Judea concerning you, nor have any of the brethren come here and reported or spoken anything bad about you. But we desire to hear from you what your views are. For concerning this sect, it is known to us that it is spoken against everywhere. When they had set a day for Paul, they came to him at his lodging in large numbers, and he was explaining to them by solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God and trying to persuade them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and from the prophets from morning until evening. Some were being persuaded by the things spoken, but others did not believe. And when they did not agree with one another, they began le leaving after Paul had spoken one, um, one parting word. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke through Isaiah the prophet to our fathers, saying, <clears throat> Go to this people and say, You will keep on hearing, but will not understand. And you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. For the heart of this people has become dull, and with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and return, and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this salvation of God has been sent to the Gentiles. They will also listen. When he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness, unhindered. End of the book. Just like that. What happened? So, what we want to do is basically, I want us to see, well, let me give you a little bit of the geography before we get into the text. This is a, a close-up of this island, which is about um, 60 miles. If you remember Italy and Sicily, which is the football, you know, Sicil Sicily is like the football with Italy is like the foot, right? This is about 60 miles out in the Mediterranean below Sicily, and <clears throat> it's a small island. It's only about 18 miles long and 8 miles wide, and it's, it may be called a different name back then or, back, or today, but Malta was the time. And if you're able to see where the dotted line and arrow comes to, this is the place, and we're pretty certain that this was the spot where they landed. And I got some pictures of it. This is a uh, modern day deals, but it's kind of cool because it's got protection from those winds. And uh, this one in particular, I like that place. <laughs> that reminds me a little bit of a place in Hawaii where we would go sometimes and it was so, so nice. The, wa the waves weren't bad and it, the water was very clear. And uh, you could sunburn your back real quickly because you were so fascinated with, uh, scoop, with, the, with snorkeling in that area. But uh, this, is, this is a picture of that spot. And if you look real close, you'll see Paul under one of the... No, not really. <clears throat> now, from the, the bottom, I had to blow this map up quite a little bit. But this is the portion of the journey. Um, Malta is at the very bottom. And then they left and they came up, and, and the text as we read it, they came up to Syracuse, which is on the coast of Sicily there. 
And then they went up and they cut, got to the toe, as it were, of, of Italy. And then they came up and got closer and closer until they got to Rome. And we'll see some of that in just a second. But <clears throat> this book started out... The author of this book starts out by saying that the, this, in the first two verses of the beginning of the first chapter of Acts, I want, to re, re, I want you to remember this and, and reference it. This is the story of all, quote, all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. This is what he began to do. <coughs> He then is speaking to his disciples and he says, you are to continue this. You are to, you are to follow up and you are to make disciples. And he gives them the strategy. It's going to start in Jerusalem. It's going to spread outside of Jerusalem and keep going in concentric circles until it really comes throughout the world. And this is exactly what we have been seeing in the book of Acts. It started in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. The Spirit of God came in a mighty way and demonstrated that the apostles, uh, that Peter and the apostles were indeed God's appointed individuals. They had signs that proved that they were from God. And the, the message of the gospel was effective. People by the thousands were saved on that day and in the following days. And Jerusalem was all of a sudden coming underneath the effect of Christians coming to Christ. And then it spread from there. And then, of course, we, we, we kind of transitioned from Peter in the book to Paul and how that he had been the primary persecutor and uh, he tormentor of the Christians. He hated Christ. He hated Christians. But when he met Christ, there was a change. He saw the resurrected Lord, and, that, and we pointed out a few times that this is one of the greatest things that we ought to evaluate our own lives. Do we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ? It should make a difference. The thing, he, he, his power for his resurrection is the same power that changes people from one kind of failure, hopeless, and giving them purpose, power, and direction, Christ makes the difference. Christ makes the difference. <clears throat> and now, when we, uh, when we leave this book, to contrast from what we saw in the first few verses of chapter 1, we get to the end, and look at the way it ends. It says... <clears throat> that Paul was still preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice the last words, with all openness and unhindered. And so it kind of leaves us without a conclusion. It leaves us with just looking for the next steps. And we can kind of piece that together from other sources, but the book of Acts particularly kind of ends in a way that the Spirit of God says, and now it's your turn. Now you carry this. The Spirit of God will help you like he helped the apostles, like he, was in, like he enabled Paul. And what we want to ask, the question that we want to ask ourselves in this, is how does God, if this is not all up to our ingenuity and up to our power and our resources, how does God accomplish this supreme mission, this great commission of going into all the world and doing what? The nope. More specifically, make disciples. disciples. This is the singular thing out of the mouth of our, of our authoritative risen Lord. Make disciples make disciples. It was Paul's command of all nations, and it is still every bit as much of the thing that we will answer to God for. You want to know why you're here? Make disciples. 
No one in this room, no one who has ever come to Jesus Christ and gotten their sins forgiven is out from under. That, there's no exceptions. This is what the book of Acts should have convinced us of. We are to bring people to Christ, introduce them to Him. He changes them. They then have purpose. They join us in making what? Disciples. So the story goes on and on. <clears throat> now, so in one sense it was completed. But in another sense, it's, the, the story is open and ongoing. And we, it's, it's, like I said earlier, we are in our first hour, we're beginning a series in what happened after Paul died, what has happened around the world with this thing about the church? How did this spread and what kind of attacks have come against it? And we're, we're starting to look into, a, I think Tommy Nelson is doing a great job. He holds your attention on, on the, the different movements geographically and the issues that, that challenged and threatened the church of Christ. But in another sense, this is still unaccomplished. We're still doing this 2000 years later. Now, ultimately, Re Revelation tells us in chapter 5, verse 9, that when the age is finished and the church is complete, Revelation 5, 9 says that one day in heaven, there's going to be an assembly. And represented in that massive group of people are some, and I'm quoting, from every single tribe, tongue, and nation. There will be no one, there'll be no group that was left out. Not everyone in the world by any means accepts Christ by their own choice. But there, there's going to be gathered together those who Jesus has purchased with his own blood. And it's going to be quite a marvelous praise service when, when that group gets together. Now today, we certainly have a lot to do. Estimates are some, I don't know how they come up with this, frankly, but here's what I read. And you can believe anything on the internet, right? <clears throat> Today there are nearly, or maybe over, 7.75 billion people in the world. Something like that. Give or take a couple. <clears throat> and according to missiologists, those that study... Uh, the, the, the thing about population emission, there are over 3 billion people in over 7,000 people groups that are unreached with the gospel. Now, let me explain unreached. <clears throat> unreached does not mean that the people are just lost. It does not mean that they, have, that, that, that they don't have access uh, or unreached means that they don't, that they do not even have access to the gospel. It's not that they can hear or have, have heard the gospel and chose not to believe it. They can't hear it because they have no one near them to tell them. There's a lot of work to be done. That's a lot of people groups. I, um, this meant a lot. This has meant a lot to my wife and I that we, we tried. We, went, we, we were directed to be going to a part of the world that had uh, m many languages that had, the Word of God had never been translated into it. They, that was a big hindrance for them. And the, the, because of the geography there, was, it was difficult to reach those. We were... For many years, every effort was being geared for us to go to a part of the world called Oceania. Do you know what that, what that is? This, is? this doesn't show up on the globe because it's so small. These are these little teeny scattered islands. And they, but because of the distances between them, they have languages and they have... Uh, it's, it's a difficult, challenging part of the world to reach them. And that was our burden, was to be spend the rest of our lives ministering in Oceania. And the Lord sent us to the hardest place possible. 
<clears throat> no, that was after Hawaii. Hawaii was planning and, and preparation to go to Oceania because we had representatives from all over. No, he sent us to Utah. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm joking. I thought it was very kind of him to let us be here and uh, be able to spend so, so much of our life here. But we need to answer the question from the text. And here's what this, this portion that we read today will tell us. How does God <clears throat> accomplish his great commission? In this final chapter, we see a number of things that really the credit goes to him alone. How does he accomplish this great commission? If you have the back of your bulletins, you can fill in the missing blanks there, <clears throat> or the blanks that need the, the, the filling in. In the first 16 verses of our passage, we get some answers to this. First of all, God protects or God provides the, the great commission by protecting his saints. This passage is a great example. So when Paul, when they, when the 276 passengers were shipwrecked, can't you just picture it? It's cold. They're hypo, is it hypothermic? Is that the one when you're cold and your body begins to not function? And, and uh, they, they drag themselves up. And I can, I mean, I'm, 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 my imagination is saying that they're kissing the dirt you know, their love. This is the first time since they left and the, the winds caught them and then they were in such dangerous. Every minute they thought they were going to die out in that ocean. And now they're on dry land. Well, it wasn't dry because it was raining. But they get on the beach and they don't even know where they're at. And they are counting and they discover every single soldier prisoner, sailor, every single passenger has made it as Paul said God had told him that it would be. Can you imagine the looks on their faces as they're, they, they are drenched and they're shivering and, and, and they're, just, they're just rejoicing to have, to have life after all that ordeal? And then out from the land come some people and they don't know if they're going to be hostile. They don't know anything. They don't even know where they are. And the people come out and the text tells us that they were kind. And the first thing that they begin to do is they start gathering sticks. Which, If it's raining, that was a little chore to find dry wood. And they start a fire. And Paul, even though he has, he probably... I don't know. The text doesn't tell us, but as a prisoner, he had chains on. And I thought, you know, I wonder what happened when, the, when Julia said, okay, everybody, we're going to abandon ship. Those of you that can swim, you go first. And the rest of you, as you can get something from this boat, some plank or something that you can hang on to and get in and start heading to that beach over there. And Paul might have gone, what about these? These chains, how am I going to do it? I don't know what they did. The text doesn't tell us, but he very well might have just tried to, you know, butterfly kick or whatever he had to do in order that he got there. And all the other prisoners with their chains and they all arrived. And in spite of the fact that he is older, he's chained, he's been in terrible condition like the rest of them in the shipwreck, this, this ship situation, the storm. What does he do? The text tells us he starts helping and he's gathering wood and he's trying to help build these fires to serve these other people on, on that beach. And we see what happened. So th there is, th I understand from the study that there is no longer on this island any poisonous snakes. That was true in Hawaii. I liked that about Hawaii. And so, but at that time there were, and the locals evidently were familiar with it. And when they saw the one that had latched onto him and was injecting its venom, they knew what that snake was and they expected him to die. And he didn't probably as in the warmth of the fire, 
The snake, you know, which is cold-blooded, was all stiff and hard to move, but then when it got a little bit warmer, and it latched onto his hand, and uh, he, they thought he was a goner. And then nothing happened. The poison, I'm sure, was injected. I don't know. But the snake was obviously known to be a poisonous snake. But they thought he was going to die. And then they saw that nothing happened. Now, in their superstition, they, they figure that he must be divine. And so they begin to change their minds and figure that he's a god. Also, <clears throat> the Bible tells us in this story, God had already promised. Remember, we talked about back in chapter 23, verse 11, that the Lord had, had sent an angel to him. Well, actually, in 23, 11, the Lord had himself come to him when he was still in captivity in Caesarea and said, you're going to go to Rome and you're going to preach. You're going to represent me in Rome. So Paul knew that he couldn't die, but the Lord um, delivered him from the storm, delivered him from the soldiers that wanted to kill them, delivered them from the potential of angry of, of, uh, of the islanders that could have not wanted to take care of them. The Lord's protection, because folks, the Great Commission is the, is the plan. It doesn't mean that a person who is serving the Lord, that nothing can happen to them. <clears throat> the apostles throughout the New Testament, <clears throat> the apostles were promised that God was going to give them sp specific grace. They wouldn't, uh, poisonous snakes wouldn't kill them. They would be able to demonstrate their, their message was from God by doing miraculous things, very obvious things that were that were not some hidden like, oh, I'm now all better and nobody, nobody can verify it by, uh, you know, seeing you, them knocked on the head or something like that in one of these healing services that you see around today. But he went not, and we see this in this case, he was miraculously protected because it was God's purpose that he would bear witness in Rome. So what, what, whether it be a shipwreck or a poisonous snake, he's kind of he's kind of immune right now to being to being killed. There's we wonder why that says here in the text <clears throat> that there was um, in the ship that they that they traveled on when they left that island. It says uh, where's it at that they, they, were, they put out, oh, it's in verse 11. It said that after three months, they set sail on an Alexandrian ship. It was probably another one like the one they had, had been on as far as a grain. It was a, a ship that carried grain. And it had been wintering there. But it's, it, it adds this little detail, which this ship had the twin brothers for its figurehead. Have you seen those pictures in these sailing vessels on the front? They will have some sort of a, of a figure that sticks out over the water. And in this case, <clears throat> this represented um, these, these twin brothers were called Castor and Pollux. And they believed that the locals, the Romans, believed that they, the myth, mythical god Zeus had transformed these two into gods. <clears throat> and that they were, they were for protection. And, uh, but the Lord, Luke knew and Paul knew and every, all these passengers now knew that the, the real god of Paul was the one that had granted them protection. The second thing that the text shows us, that God accomplishes his great commission. And by the way, there is protection. If you're in the service of the Lord, nothing can happen to you outside of the will of God. Doesn't mean that you'll never get sick or that you'll never have anything. But nothing can happen outside of what God, if God's got a plan for you, he will fulfill that uh, uh, unconditionally through you. 
So the second thing is that God accomplishes his great commission is by providing for his servants. It could have gone a whole different way. Uh, when they got there, there was really unusual hospitality offered by these natives of the island of Malta. And this leading man that we're introduced to here, Pub Publius, Publius, he, think of it, when, he, when that guy got up that morning, little did he know that he and his people were going to entertain 276 visitors that were going to show up with nothing but the clothes on their, on their backs. And they just took care of them. Apparently, they lodged them for the rest of the winter. All the food that they needed, the clothes and warmth that they needed, and the protection that they needed. And it says in chapter 28, verse 10, that they honored them with many gifts and supplies. So God provided in a marvelous way for them. And it went on as they left that island and worked their way all up, up the way along the coast to Rome. God provided through Christians that came out as far as uh, from 40, 44 miles south of Rome at three taverns, 33 miles to escort Paul into the city. Can you imagine? Think of it. So all these people are still, they all are destined, all 276, maybe now more from the passengers on the ship that they, that they joined that were already headed up to Rome. So, but they're all going together, and Paul's just one of this group. And as they land in these places, word had gone ahead of time that the Apostle Paul was in this group. And here he is a prisoner. And then all of a sudden, these crowds of people start coming out and greeting this old, battered, veteran man of God, Paul. I, I tell you, those soldiers are going, what is this? You know, is, is it, are they trying to break him free or something? And what? But no, they were loving and, and courteous and just loving on him. <clears throat> and, and Julius evidently goes along with it. I wonder if Julius hadn't come to Christ. You just wonder, don't you? It, with all the stuff that had gone on with that voyage. And I'm sure that Paul thanked God and was very much encouraged when he saw these Christians that he had longed to see. He writes from other epistles. When he wrote the book of Romans, he had never been there. The letter to the, to the church at Rome, he had never been there. And he says in that, I long to see you. And now he is beginning to see them. What Christian fellowship is sweet fellowship. So there's provision for that. He was so encouraged. <clears throat> and he was provided for to allow him to stay by himself with the soldier who was guarding him. And the money we find out from Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 through 18. When Paul writes a thank you letter to the church at Philippi. A church that really was kind of not that wealthy, but they were a generous, open-hearted people. And he says, you have supplied my needs. He's writing this letter from Rome and they were sending money apparently to help pay for his rent on the place that he as a prisoner had to stay and chain next to this guard. I don't know if they had to reimburse or feed the guard as part of that arrangement so that it wasn't a burden on the, on the government. But God provided. Because what's at stake is the gospel still being going out from this, the mouth of this man. He's still one. And I just want, if we had more time, I, I began to reflect on the years that we have been missionaries. And I, I really wish I would have written more down. I, there was a, the time that we were, I was up, uh, we had gone to a little, uh, it was a big church up in Huntington, West Virginia. They had a missions conference and the way they did missions conferences, they brought in a whole bunch of missionaries. They had one or two keynote speakers. I was not one of those. 
And then they would do these things where they would give you like 30 seconds and they would line up the missionaries and you'd come one at a time to the pulpit and you would just have 30 seconds to introduce yourself. And that was all we had, just that little thing. And then all those other missionaries that were there too with all their works from all kind of other places. And I really thought, well, this is great. It was encouraging for us to be there and hear those speakers and meet these people. And from there we went, I, I had to go up to uh, the headquarters at the time was outside of Philadelphia and, and they had a three story ancient building. I think Benjamin Franklin had been in that building. It was an old, cold, big old building. And I was running around trying to work on some of the technology in there and just really trying to get my work done so I could get back home. The family was somewhere else and I was there alone just working. And as I was running down this hall, really almost running, there was a guy in the office that saw me and he said, Tom, Tom, come, stop, come in here. And I came back in and kind of, what, 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 I've got a lot to do. And he goes, do you know, and he mentioned a name, and I go, never heard of him in my life. And I said, why? He goes, because they just sent you a check for $8,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I said, well, well, where did it come from? What part? And he said, well, apparently you were at a church somewhere in Huntington, and the Lord spoke to them through whatever you did there, and I went, wow, there was not much opportunity to get to know anybody in that conference. And, you know, and I, I thought, wow, I got ideas for that money. But the Lord had ideas. And within a few days, the transmission in our vehicle started not working. And then the engine started knocking. And you know what? It cost just that amount of money. And I could tell you a hundred stories like that. This is all we were doing was trying to serve the Lord in being representatives and those who were concerned about the Great Commission. I never ever thought in my wildest dreams that we would ever own a home or a piece of property. I just was content. We're going to live some... some parsonage or some rented hut or something or other. I was just content with it. Last year we paid off our home and I thought, Lord, how did that happen? The Lord provides for his servants because he's accomplishing the spreading of the gospel in the Great Commission. Thirdly, and there's stories that you could give. It's not just for full-time Christian workers. Don't you have stories like that where God has done things that you did not expect in providing for you? Sure he has. Thirdly, God accomplishes his great commission by empowering his servants. The Bible tells us that even though Luke was the physician, isn't this interesting? Luke's the physician, but who did all the healing? It doesn't, he, you know, I don't think he went, well, how come they're not coming to my office? I put the shingle up there and nobody's coming here. They're all going over to the guy that's a tent maker. Well, he had miraculous ability as an apostle. Did you know that in 1887, it was discovered there was a particular disease, an affliction that was that came from bacterium in the milk of Maltese goats, the goats on that island. And it produced those same symptoms that, that he's talking about, this fever and this dysentery. And apparently this was a long, this, this was, goes all the way back there, very likely. And this father had been sick with a fever for some time. And this was the father of the leading man on the island. And Paul goes, and by the power of the Spirit of God, this Malta fever, 
and it says it could last from four months to several years. And he was able, by the miraculous power of the grace of God upon him, to authenticate that he was truly an apostle of Christ. And he was able to heal that man. He was the first walking antibiotic. When that happened, the text tells us that they began to bring other people to him. The word spread. And pretty soon, all the sick and afflicted from the island were brought, and every one was healed. They were empowered. Now, <clears throat> I believe that that was the case in apostolic times. I believe that all of the apostles were promised by the Lord that, they, that poison would not hurt them, that they would, uh, they would have these supernatural abilities to demonstrate that they were God's appointed representatives, Christ's appointed representatives. But can God still heal today? Yes. He can. There's a story, an interesting story, that uh, was, was uh, about a fella that left his Minnesota home when he was 19 years old. He had no support for his missionary calling. He had no contacts to take the gospel, but he was burdened for a tribe in the jungles of South America. When he got to this tribe, they shot him with arrows, but he survived. At another point, he was so deep in the jungle and he was afflicted terribly with hepatitis. And he was probably close to death. And it just so happened that there were two men from an oil company that were in a helicopter. They were out for a joyride over this territory. And they spotted this blonde man down in a clearing on the ground below. And one of the men in that helicopter just so happened to turn out to be a doctor whom this missionary whose name was last name was Olson had known from years before. Hmm. So they took him to the hospital where the doctor said that if he had not been brought there in like six hours, he would have definitely been dead. And they told him that he would be in treatment for over six months and that his liver was so permanently damaged that he could never, ever go back to that jungle. But this missionary, this Olson, knew that God wanted him to reach those natives. So he told the doctors, you're wrong. I'm going back. Three weeks later, he was released. And a week after that, he walked back into the jungle. On the third day, he began to feel dizzy. The chest pains returned. His urine was dark. As he fell asleep that night, he was terribly afflicted. And he prayed. He said, Father, bring me. You brought me here to work with these Indians. Please, God, heal my body. The next morning, he woke up feeling fine. No more pain. His urine was good. He went back to minister to them. And the, the natives saw evidence over and over again in that man that God had sent there of miraculous things. And the Lord used him to reach that tribe. God does special things when the salvation of souls is at stake. Now, finally, God accomplishes his great commission through his servants. There are some that I think are so leaning onto the side of the sovereignty of God that they overlook the clear teaching of Scripture that we have a God-given responsibility. And I cannot bring these two points together. All I can tell you is, thus saith the Lord. 
God is sovereign. God can do anything. And God has lovingly selected to reach into lost humanity and to open the minds of some to hear the gospel and believe. I praise God that that happens because otherwise there'd be no hope. But he uses us to do it. It's really odd in the text that we're looking at today that Luke never says a word about Paul preaching the gospel on that island or any other place. He doesn't talk about any particular conversion. I believe there probably were people that heard the gospel and believed. I believe there's the great possibility there were people on that ship that were delivered that hung on every word that Paul said after that incident. But the, the Bible doesn't record any of that. We do not know those details. But we can assume from all that we have seen in Paul up to this point, that guy never, ever missed an opportunity to share the gospel no matter what. Right? When he got to Rome, he said, let's not waste time. He put out the word. I need to talk to all the Jewish leaders that are here. I need to let them know why I'm here and we need to get acquainted. And I want the chance to share the gospel with them, to share Christ with them. And he spent the entire day, the text tells us, testifying about the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God not only refers to the future kingdom of Christ's future reign on earth, but it's also the effects of the gospel that brings people under his rule right now. I trust that you're in his kingdom by trusting in Christ. I'm sure that he used, as he'd done on other occasions, he talked about how Moses and the Jewish sacrificial system, how it all pointed and illustrated the, sac the ultimate sacrifice that Jesus would make. I'm sure that he took them to the passage in Psalm 16 and in Psalm 22 that talked about the resurrection and talked about the nature of the, the kind of death by crucifixion that had not even been invented yet back in the Psalms. And of course, he took them to Isaiah 53. That is one of the most graphic of all passages in the entire Bible of how the Lamb of God would be slain for our sin. And he shared with them the gospel. And the outcome was that some believed. Isn't that good? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. It's not, our, it's not up to us, but the truth is. The Spirit of God takes the truth and He does bring this. He brings people out, but some don't. And that's what happened here too. Others did not believe. And it brought, in verse 25, it brought about a conflict between the two. And Paul at some point steps back and he watches the believers and the rejectors beginning to tear into one another. And then he got their attention and he said, listen, this is prophesied too. And he talks about Isaiah chapter, the, the quote that is given in our text comes from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, where the prophet Isaiah says, I'm sending you to these people, but it's not going to be easy. They're going to hear your words and they're not going to hear them. They're going to see the message and they're not going to see it. They're not going to, they're going to understand and then they're not going to understand. They're hard there's the, the, the majority of the people that are going to hear this, but I'm sending you anyway. And so Paul went. The main idea of these verses that he quoted is that if people close up their hearts to God's word through his messengers, the Lord will confirm their rejection by hardening them even further. You hear the truth, you don't respond to the truth, it'll be harder to hear it again. And then he ends after that quote, he says in verse 28, that he's going to be taking the gospel to the Gentiles. You know, 
the Jewish nation was supposed to, the plan was that they were supposed to be the ones to be the light to the nations to take this out. But they rejected their, their Messiah and they failed to take this to the world. And so God says, I'm still interested in these, uh, in these nations. And so they were sent. <clears throat> and he goes on to say, they will listen in verse 28. And they had. Churches were springing up. The church at Rome was already going and Paul had not even been there because of the people in other places that had heard the gospel and had come back to Rome. And the, we're already beginning to see what we see today as Christians share the gospel and churches are founded. Well, Luke never tells us anything about the final out outcome of Paul's trial. He's there in Rome for a trial. Apparently it was about two years worth of time before he actually appeared before the emperor of Rome. Probably around, they figure around the year 62. During that time, while he was in rented quarters, chained to a Roman soldier, he wrote the books called the prison epistles, your book in your Bible called Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians and Philemon were all written during that time. And then his apparently his accusers never showed up. And so by default, he was released. He probably visited again some of the churches. It's possible we learned from the, the book that he wrote to the, to the Romans earlier that his intention was to come there and then go from there with their help to go on further to the country of Spain. We don't know, but that was his intention. He may have done that. He began, as he wrote, the book of First Timothy and Titus while he was still free. And he began to prepare for the next generation and sending young men into places and say, here's how it works in the Lord's church. Here's how leadership, the standard for leadership, and here's the emphasis you want to do. Those things were written. And then we don't know exactly how it could have been that there was Someone by the name of Alexander, he was a coppersmith that may have been a Benedict Arnold, may have turned him in. This time he was not to be released. Paul writes about it and he says, he's done me great harm. While he was in prison this second time, he wrote his final letter, four chapters to his beloved son in the faith, Timothy. And at the end of that, he said, I have fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Beloved, that's the message that we're looking at. It's we're brought safely through. Then that storm was about to be over. They, they believe, they're pretty confident that just outside of Rome, they know, the, they know the spot in which he was escorted, where he was, as because he was a Roman citizen, he was not to be sent to the arena to be tortured or to be killed by gladiators or wild beasts. It's interesting, they, they think that Peter at the same time was apprehended and they were in Rome as captives, as prisoners, Paul and Peter at the same time. I don't know if they were able to talk or not. Because Peter was not a Roman citizen, you know how he was killed, right? They were going to crucify him. And he said, please do it with me upside down. I don't, I don't, I'm not worthy to be identified and the same with my Lord. So they did. They honored it. They crucified him upside down. But Paul, as a Roman citizen, was escorted out. And he was taken to a place where he was bound and his head was laid onto a pillar. 
and an executioner that was skilled with a sharp sword. It had been an axe. They tell us that just before this time that they switched to using a large sword. And with a lot of Christians that loved him standing by, Paul yielded his neck to the pillar. And there was a flash. And he said, I'm now with the Lord. Paul died in victory. I finished my course. Beloved, every single one of us in Christ, there's a course laid out for us. It's not the same as somebody else's. It's the course for you. Are you going to be able to say, I finished my course. I fought a good fight. It will come to an end one time or another in the Lord's providence and plan. How are you doing in the fight? The book of Acts continues. We're still doing that that Paul started. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the example of this man of God at one time was such an enemy to the cross, a persecutor of those that followed Christ. And then one day you introduced him to the truth. And in a moment, his eyes, his spiritual eyes were clear and his life was completely turned around. And you called him to be an ambassador to the Gentiles. Probably one of the greatest missionaries for the church that's ever walked this earth. Father, I thank you for the study that we have been privileged to be able to go through together. Thank you for all of the lessons of perseverance and dedication out of his love for thee. And Lord, may it be that we would translate that story into our own lives and to say, Lord, how important is this to me? Am I going to be one that, like Paul, sees the purpose of my life is to serve my Savior by being an ambassador of the Great Commission? Father, thank you for the people that you have used over the years to see this work come into being. Thank you for those that have laid aside their own personal interests and plans and have just said, Lord, if, if you can use me, here I am. I just want my life to count for eternity. So, Father, we, we pray that your hand of direction and clarity would work among us, the young people as well as the older people. Help us, Lord, to put things into perspective in light of all that you have done for us and given to us. And may we one day, like Paul, be able to say, I finished my course. I fought the fight. I've kept the faith. And then we look forward to the reward. It's not that we work for our salvation, but because you have given to us so full and free of your forgiveness, we are now yours, I trust. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen.